Hello everybody, I'm Laureen Peretz and I'll be your professor for advanced legal research. I'll go a bit more into my background during the first class. For now, I'll just let you know that I practiced law for many years and I have a really good feel for how to conduct legal research in the real world. And I plan to make that the focus of this class. Put it another way, if I don't think you're likely to face a particular issue or use a particular research technique in practice, then I'm not going to waste your time talking about it in this class. After all, you get plenty of theory in your other classes. So here, we're just going to stick to the nuts and bolts of how to work through real life legal research problems. So here's how I'll structure each class. For most of the classes, you'll be watching a video lecture just like this one. These lectures will introduce you to the topic that we'll be considering that week in class, statutes, case law, corporate transactions, etc. And then I'll demonstrate the resources that you can use when you have a question in that area. Then when we get to class, I'll give you some legal research exercises so you can get a chance to play around and use these resources yourself. These kind of exercises really are the best way to learn legal research techniques. It's much more effective than me just lecturing at you. So we're going to be doing a lot of them throughout the semester. That being said, it's absolutely vital that you watch the video every week before class. Often the first thing we'll do in class will be you diving directly into a legal research problem using the information and the resources that I presented in the video lecture. If you haven't watched the video, you won't know how to approach the legal research problem for that week. I promise the videos will be short. They won't ever be longer than a half hour, and they'll often even be shorter than that. So just make sure you watch them. Also, please make sure that you submit your answers to the quiz each week. These weekly submissions count towards your 20 professionalism and participation points for the course. For more on that, see the syllabus. All right, so here's our first legal research problem. You're working at some big law firm in Manhattan, and late Thursday afternoon, you get a call from your senior partner telling you that he's about to go on a wine tasting and buying holiday in Napa. He's a connoisseur, and by the end of his trip, he wants to have filled up his expensive climate-controlled wine cellar. He makes the decision that he actually wants to buy wine in Napa and ship it home to his brownstone in Brooklyn. He thinks he's going to get some great deals in Napa. It suddenly occurs to him at the last minute, and it always does seem to occur to the partners at the last minute, that he wants to ship them home, but he's not sure it's legal. That is, are private individuals even allowed to ship wine across state lines? He's concerned because he vaguely remembers something about some case or some statute that said he either could or he could not ship the wine. He can't remember the details, so he tells you that you should take a look at the issue and give him some legal guidance before he leaves for his trip. Specifically, can he ship cases of wine home to himself or not? If he can, are there limitations on what he can ship? He also wants to know what law governs this issue. Is it California, New York, federal law? And then where do you find the answer to this kind of legal issue? Is it case law, statutes, regulations, something else? Maybe a combination of all three. So this is a good example of the kind of problem we'll be doing as we work our way through the semester. You need to read the information presented and identify the legal issues. Research the issues the best you can, giving, giving the resources that we're covering for that week, and try to reach some kind of preliminary legal conclusion. Then we're always going to spend some time talking about how everybody did. We'll discuss what problems you had, what roadblocks you ran into when you were doing the research. You're going to have to be ready to do a lot of participation in this class. It's a small class, so we spend a lot of time talking about how everybody approached the research, what worked, what didn't. You can talk to each other while you're doing the research, so it's a very active class. All right, so now let's spend a minute talking about how do you go through the process of a legal research problem like the one you see here. What are the first steps? How do you develop a legal research plan? How do you effectively and efficiently conduct legal research? And how do you formulate advice? Here, are you gonna send the partner off on his wine buying spree with a happy face or not? So for the other classes, we'll dive right into the research. But since this is the first class, we're gonna spend a little time talking about the process. How do you break the problem down? How do you analyze it? And how do you formulate the answer so you can present it to a senior lawyer or to a client? So, as I said, just before we get started with how I might research this wine shipping problem, let's spend a minute talking about the legal research process in general. When you first start out in practice, you're likely to get your research assignments from a more senior lawyer that you're working with, either a senior associate or a partner. Later on, as you become more senior, you'll get your research assignments directly from clients. So in either case, your first job is to make sure that you really understand the facts and the issues that you need to research before you leave that senior attorney's office or before you hang up with the client on their frantic phone call. 
And this is just a practice tip. It's harder than it sounds to actually do this, but it's vital. Lawyers are busy and they tend to be rushed at the best of times. They forget, they genuinely forget that you don't know everything that they do. And I just don't mean the law. They may already know everything about their client's business, for example, and they forget that you don't know everything about the client's business. So they start talking in shorthand. It's something that's not going to make sense to somebody who hasn't been representing that client for a while. So what do you do? You have to be strong. You have to insist that the senior lawyer spend a few minutes to fill you in on the problem and the issues that they want you to focus on. Believe me, they will like you the better for it in the end because you'll give them better research results. Also, when you get back to your office, you also need to avoid the temptation to just start researching. Just like get back to your office and turn on Westland and start researching. Instead, you should first make sure that you've read and you understand all the documents that you've been given. So for example, if you're researching an issue involving a corporate agreement, read the agreement. If you're a litigator, read the complaint or the other documents in the file. If the client has written a letter requesting legal help, read that. Call them if something doesn't make sense. Obviously, you're not calling them to ask for help with the legal issues. You're calling to ask for help in interpreting the facts. Something doesn't make sense. There's a term you don't understand. There's a business that doesn't seem like it fits in. Call and ask. Call the client. Call the senior attorney. Everybody's going to be happy in the end. It sounds like a no-brainer, but it's sometimes tempting to dive right into research before you fully understand the issue and avoid that temptation. It's going to cost you in the end. So the next step after you do your interview and you feel like you've got a good handle on what the facts are is this is where you're kind of actually going to begin doing your research. And it's to look at a secondary source to help yourself understand the law in the area that you're researching. This step is probably the single best piece of advice that I'm going to give you for the whole semester. Reading case law, statutes, regulations, primary law, conducting legal research in other words is really hard, tedious, and confusing work. It just is. That's probably why you're all taking this class. That is, after all, why they pay lawyers the big bucks. If it was easy, nobody would be willing to pay lawyers hundreds of dollars an hour to do this stuff. Anyway, so the trick to doing really good legal research is use a good secondary resource first. Primary resources are the law itself, cases, statutes, regulations, etc. Secondary resources are anything that explains the primary law. Things like legal encyclopedias, law review articles, blog posts, etc. And don't worry, we'll be spending the next two classes exclusively discussing all of these secondary resources and why you would use one instead of another, what one does that the other one doesn't. But for now, it's just enough that you get a handle on how secondary resources fit into the research process. Use them first and then move on to the primary law. After you've used a secondary resource to learn the area of the law that you're researching, then go ahead and read the primary law. You will be amazed how much easier it is to understand and apply primary law after you've consulted a good secondary source. Secondary sources will also, of course, point you to the relevant primary law. So if I'm researching a securities law, insider trading issue, a good secondary resource is going to explain to me all the specifics of that area of securities law, and it's also going to give me citation for all of the relevant cases, statutes, and regulations, so I can easily go and pull up the primary law in Westlaw, Lexis, Bloomberg, or some other database and print if I want. So the last step in the legal research process, as you see here on the slide, and this is critical, update everything you cite to or rely on before giving your legal opinion every single time. Even if you're just giving an off-the-cuff oral response to a legal research question, and this happens a lot, you'll get a call from a senior lawyer or a client and they don't want a memo or a long answer and even an email, they just want a quick answer over the phone. For assignments like this though, and if you don't want to commit malpractice, and I know you don't, you still need to make sure that the law that you're relying on is still good law. It doesn't matter for these purposes whether you did an hour of research and you're giving five minutes of advice over the phone, or if you're writing a brief or a detailed memo. You still need to know that the law you cite and rely on is good law. After all, it isn't uncommon for cases to be overruled or for statutes to be appealed or amended. Fortunately, we have great tools on Lexis and Westlaw like Shepherds and Keysight that allow us to do this kind of updating fairly painlessly. So you can take statutes, case law, and regulations to Westlaw or Lexis, whichever one you have at your firm, and confirm that you're only citing good law. 
We'll spend a fair amount of time discussing these tools in future classes as well. So don't worry about the specifics for now. Again, we're just seeing where updating fits into the overall process of legal research. So in a nutshell, that's the legal research process. This really is the best process to follow each time you have a legal research problem. I can honestly promise you that you'll have an easier time and better results if you follow this process when you conduct your legal research. It doesn't really even matter what the question is or what area of law you're researching. Just follow these basic steps and you'll be on your way. All right, so just to get started, let's talk about primary law. Here is a very brief overview of the U.S. legal system. Fortunately, you already know most of this already. Of course, it goes without saying that you must have a basic understanding of the U.S. legal system before you can attempt to find a specific law to answer a specific legal question that you've been asked to research. So, again, as you all already know, the federal government is divided into three branches, and as it happens, each branch creates it's law that we must be concerned with as legal researchers. The legislative branch or Congress creates statutes. The judicial branch, including the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, issues opinions. And this body of opinions is called case law. The executive branch and the various executive branch agencies and departments create regulations and other administrative determinations and adjudications. And this body of law is called administrative law. As lawyers, whenever we try to help a client solve a legal issue, we have to be thoroughly familiar with each of these three sources of law. Of course, we'll cover all of these areas of primary law in much more detail as the semester goes along, but it's important to note that sometimes these different kinds of law will overlap. Sometimes they even contradict each other, and this is in practice, and it's our job to work our way through this thicket in order to advise our clients on how to proceed. So to make matters even more complicated than that, in the United States, there's two parallel systems of law, federal law and state law. State lawmaking is also usually comprised of statutes, case law, and administrative law. And again, these sources of law can overlap and contradict each other. And they also sometimes overlap and contradict federal law. Is that clear? No. Is it easy? No. But again, this is why they pay lawyers the big bucks. All right, so let's talk about the actual steps that you would follow when you're conducting legal research. And this kind of goes back to the slide we had about the process. As I mentioned, before you get started researching, you need to define the scope of your project. Are you writing an appellate brief? Or are you writing a memo to a partner? Or are you returning a phone call? Sometimes a quick phone call is all that's needed. You need to know that before you start researching and billing time. In fact, it's a good idea to come right out and ask. This never bothered me at all when I was a senior lawyer. In fact, I appreciated it because sometimes the senior lawyer might forget. So you should ask, how much time should I devote to this project? Law firms hate writing off time, so it's better to know ahead of time how much time you should be allotting to a particular research project or any kind of project, even if you're drafting an agreement. Get an idea ahead of time of what they think is reasonable. Their answer may only be a ballpark, no more than three hours, but at least you'll know that you're not going to spend a whole day on that case or that agreement. So here's another practice tip. Ask lots of questions when you first get the research assignment. You'll save yourself time, you'll save your client money, and you'll turn out a better legal research product if you insist on getting all the facts you need to narrow the issues and conduct your legal research right from the start. So once you have your arms around what kind of response you're going to be responsible for, a brief, a corporate agreement, a phone call, you have to get the facts that you need to start your research. And we've talked about this a little bit in an overview, but now we're, we're kind of narrowing down on some of the issues. So the next thing you need to do is take the time to develop a research plan before you ever open a book or look at an electronic research database like Lexis or Westlaw. You need to figure out what legal issue you're researching because no one's going to tell you that. Unlike law school, clients don't come in and tell you what the legal question is that they want answered. They just present you with facts and it's up to you to figure out what the issue is and then to go ahead and research it. So this is how you get started. You do issue spawning. You look at the facts and you figure out who, what, when, where, why, and how. You can ask yourself some of the questions on this slide. This is going to help you to start figuring out what is the issue, what is the problem, and then once you have a handle on that, you move on to the next step. And that next step is you develop a list of key terms, search terms. Uh, you develop these terms to use in your search for the answer to your client's legal problem. And it doesn't matter whether you're searching on the internet or you're searching on a paid legal research platform like Lexis, Westlaw, Bloomberg Law, etc. You want to have a list of search terms to input into whatever platform you're using to conduct your research. Coming up with a few good key terms ahead of time helps you to craft a search that's going to give you fewer results 
but that are more highly relevant. You really don't want to run something like a typical Google search where you return hundreds of thousands of documents. It is much better to run a high quality search and return 30 documents that are all highly relevant. So this means you have fewer things to look through, but the ones that you do look through are more likely to answer your questions. That sounds good, right? So here's how you do that. How do you come up with these magic keywords that are going to get you those results? And here's four ways that you can do it. You can use a dictionary like Black's Law Dictionary or a legal thesaurus to find terms of art in the area you're researching. Race ipsa loquitur, or detrimental reliance, things like that. It's how the experts are talking about a particular issue and you're more likely to return documents that are exactly on point if you have the keywords. So that's one way to narrow down on the, the way that a cause of action or a particular corporate concept are being written about. You can also use a website that discusses your issue. This could be like a US government agency website so you can see how a particular area of the law is framed and discussed by the experts. You could talk to the person giving you the assignment and that's not a bad idea. Just ask them, how would you approach this research? Where would you search? What terms would you use? And they'll take the time to tell you what they would do if you ask. They probably won't take the time if you don't ask though, so you should ask. Um, and if all that fails, you can always try brainstorming by jotting down as many synonyms and related words as you can come up with. Coming up with synonyms is important because different legal research platforms use different terms for the same legal issues. I mean, you can easily see this. For example, an issue relating to a minor can be found under children, minors, infants, parent and child. So if you know that, you can construct a search that takes all of these alternatives into account. That way you won't miss anything important, but you'll still have an efficient search. The next step is to figure out what law applies so you can go ahead and conduct your research. This is not actually that easy to do because there's no way to know when you're first getting started with legal research what law is likely to govern a particular issue. Is the law governed by statute? case law, administrative law, civil, criminal, federal, state law, maybe a combination of some or all of the above. So let's see how we figure this out. Let's go back to our senior partner who wants to ship cases of wine home from Napa. What type of primary law is going to apply? Statute, case law, administrative law, a combination of all three? Is it federal or state law? And remember, it's likely that the legislature, the courts, and the executive branch may all have touched on a topic that you're researching. So for our wine buying trip, what's the jurisdiction? Is the wine shipment governed by federal or state law? If we determine that it's state law, and here it is, is it the law of the ship from state? Here it would be California. Or the ship to state? Here it would be New York. That's going to matter. That's going to govern our issue. Okay, so let's move on and talk about how you determine all of that. And the best way, I think, to get through the maze of determining what primary law applies is, again, to use a good secondary source. As a reminder, secondary sources are anything that you use to learn about primary law. Secondary sources range from informal blog posts, for example, attorneys practicing write about the area that they're practicing all the time on their firm websites and in their individual blogs. So they range from that kind of level of inf informality to a multi-volume treatise written by, say, a Harvard Law professor on contracts or torts or employment law or something. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, determining the applicable law is hard when you're first starting out. After practicing in an area for a while, you'll have an idea of whether it's New York State statutes that govern a particular issue or maybe federal regulations are where you need to go. But when you're first starting out, or even if you're a seasoned attorney researching an area that you're not familiar with, so you're, you've been out practicing for a while but you've moved into a new area of the law, secondary resources are almost always the way to go. They can help point you in the right direction. So when you read them, they'll give you an explanation of an area of the law so that when you later read the primary law, your statute or your cases or your regulations, you'll already have the benefit of an expert explaining the law to you and giving you a framework for understanding your issue. Secondary sources also give you citations and even better in electronic research, they often give you links to the primary law. So not only are they giving you a citation, you can click on the link and actually be taken directly to the primary law. So if you read a few good secondary sources and you start seeing all these citations to the New York Public Health Law, for example, you'll know your issue is governed by a state statute, and you'll have a site to the particular provision in McKinney's where you can find your answer. 
So secondary sources are giving you the relevant law, explaining it to you, and telling you where you don't have to search. So if I find an issue is governed by New York Public Health Law, I don't have to waste my time in the U.S. Code or the Code of Federal Regulations. All right, the last step, and I really can't say it enough, and never forget to do this, even if you're giving a quick off-the-cuff answer over the phone, is to always make sure that the law you're relying on has been updated. Once you find the primary law that answers your question, you know, you found the right statute, you have the right group of cases, you need to use the citator, such as Shepherds or Keysight, to make sure that the law you're relying on is still good law. Keep in mind, you can update not only cases, but also statutes and regulations. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about all of the different ways you can update the various categories of primary law as the class moves along. Just for now, know that you can't ever skip this step. All right, so now let's actually put all this theory into practice. Let's actually do some legal research. Here's just one possible approach to researching whether our senior partner can go wild in Napa and ship cases of wine home to Brooklyn. And that is our issue. Does the law allow him to do that or not? So you probably may have thought that a law librarian would never suggest going to Google, but I use Google all the time, both when I was practicing as a lawyer and now as a law librarian, particularly when I'm first starting to research a legal question. So I wanted to introduce you to how I use it. I kind of incorporated it into the steps that I showed you before. I incorporated it into my legal research plan. I use it to issue spot. I use it to come up with key terms. So here I'm going to be using Google as a secondary source, and we're going to use that to teach ourselves this area of the law. Of course, it's important to remember that you can never end with a Google search because on the internet, anybody can say anything and you really can't trust any of it. But to get started, it's a really good thing to use. Use it to try and figure out what area of the law governs your issue, federal versus state, case law versus administrative law. And once you get some idea of that, or even better, if you get some actual citations to the primary law governing your issue, you can take that information over to Westlaw, Lexis, or some other authoritative source like a government portal, and you can retrieve the primary law so you can verify for yourself what the law says. All right, so I'm going to actually run my Google search. And there you can see I've given you a screenshot. I put in wine shipping direct to consumer. And I've gotten what looks to be a pretty interesting hit, just the first non-advertisement hit down. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And it turns out that this website's an excellent resource to help us figure out our wine shipment issue. If you look here, you can see that the site contains the wine shipment laws for all 50 states. Now, if I go ahead and click on New York, I can see that the site provides a gold mine of information. It's giving me a summary of New York law for shipping wine. It's giving me contact information. It's even giving me a state liquor authority advisory opinion about direct shipment of wine for out-of-state wineries. Sounds like just like what we were looking for. So this is a great example of how using a good secondary resource makes legal research so much easier. It usually works even better if you're using a high quality secondary resource like a treatise devoted especially to the area you're researching. So moving on, we have all of this information about state shipment and direct sales to winery visitors. And now we're going to see if we can get some information for the senior partner. So now I'm to the point where I actually have to review the primary law. I've gotten a background in it. I've gotten some citations through this SLA advisory, the State Liquor Authority advisory. And I'm going to actually take a look at that advisory. And I see that this advisory explains New York law regarding interstate wine shipment in detail. As a bonus, the advisory is giving me a citation to the specific New York statute governing direct wine shipments. All right, I'm not going to be able to stop there, though. This SLA advisory might be out of date, might have been repealed, there might be additional information that I need to know. So now it's time for me to go and read the actual text of the primary law. So to get to ABC 79C, I can go to Wexlaw, I can go to Lexis, or I can get the statute directly online from New York State. All the states now have their statutes online. For now, though, let's just use Westlaw to find 79C. So here's how I get to it on Westlaw. Starting from the home page, I go to State Materials, select New York, and then remember, I always want to use the smallest database I can so that I get fewer results but more highly relevant. So since I know I'm looking for statutes, I click on Statutes and Court Rules, and then I kind of just navigate my way through the ABC law until I eventually get to 79C. Then I pull up the law, I take a look at it, I interpret it, and I figure out the answer that I can give to the partner, tell him whether he can ship wine home from Napa or not.
And what is that answer? Well, according to ABC 79C, in order for a New York resident to directly accept delivery from an out-of-state winery, that out-of-state winery must hold a New York out-of-state direct shipper's license. So the Napa winery is going to have to have one of these licenses from New York State. Also, that out-of-state winery can ship no more than 36 cases of wine per year to any one individual. The New York resident must buy the wine for their personal use. They can't resell the wine to someone else, a liquor store, or just anyone else. And finally, the delivery of wine must be accepted by somebody who's over 21 years old. And so those are the conditions. Assuming that the senior partner and the Napa winery he visits can comply with these conditions, the news is good. He can go on his wine buying spree and he can ship the wine home to his Brooklyn Brownstone. Okay, so you have good news for the senior partner. So how do you go about framing your answer? And this is how I would do it. I would give him the good news first. He can go on his trip and he can ship the wine home. And then I would tell him, but you need to make sure that you and the shipping wineries comply with the few conditions in the ABC law. And this is how I would summarize those conditions for him. Make sure the Napa winery holds the appropriate New York State license. The partner will also need to make sure that he doesn't buy any more than 36 cases from any one winery. That may or may not be a problem for him, but that's a condition for direct shipment, so I'll have to live with the limit. He also needs to make sure that he's buying wine for his own personal use. He can't resell it at his wine club or something. And he needs to make sure that someone over 21 is going to be available to receive the shipment when it arrives at his home in Brooklyn. And that's it. Those are the conditions. If he can comply with the conditions, then he can go have fun in Napa and ship his wine home. So that's it. That's one legal research problem from beginning to end, and you saw how we followed kind of a twisty path from the free Google search where we did a broad search, and then it got pointed in the right direction by a wine industry portal, which is perfectly fine as long as you verify the law yourself. The internet can be a great place to start. It's free, so you can save some money by running preliminary searches. The only thing is you need to make sure that you don't end there. You always have to verify the primary law yourself on Lexis or Westlaw or some other credible source. Now, some other things about legal research. Every research project has a different starting point, a process, and a conclusion. There is no one right path for every question. You might follow a different path than me, and we might end up in the same place, and that's okay. It's important to realize that all of this so you don't get frustrated thinking that research is always supposed to work in the same way, because it's not and it doesn't. There's always going to be some false starts, dead ends, and revisions, and these will vary from project to project. And unless you get really lucky, uh, when you research, you're going to come to a place where you hit a brick wall. And you're going to have to go back either all the way to the beginning or just back a couple steps and start over and try something else. This won't happen as often when you get more experience with the issues and the resources in your particular practice area. But believe me, it still happens regularly even to experienced lawyers. The last thing I'll mention is the hardest. We can never really say that legal research is finished. I mean, just think of the wine buying problem that we just looked at. Sure, we could keep looking. Are there other licenses that New York has? Are there other cases, some other statutes, some other secondary resources that we could look at? For sure. But at some point, you need to realize that you've answered the question you've been given, and an experienced researcher will know when to stop. Some of the signs I use when it's time to stop is I start seeing different sources citing to the same primary law, different sources interpreting the same law in the same way. You know, of course, this is true with everything else that I've mentioned in this lecture. This all gets easier with experience. For now, though, you can kind of use those signs as your goalpost to know when it's time to stop. All right, so that's it for the video presentation. Hopefully this is going to give you some good ideas about how to approach a legal research problem with the steps that you have to follow to solve that problem for your client. We're going to have a whole semester to practice this, and we'll start off in the first class using some of the techniques that I've introduced here to research a different issue for our client. Just one last thing before you go, which is to make sure that you take the week one quiz. It appears at the end of this video lecture. Keep in mind that these quizzes are going to count towards your participation points that you receive for the class, so you want to make sure that you do them every week and that you submit them. And that's it. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. See you in class.